Hi, today's episode we have Swami Atma Nirav. He's an Osho disciple and has been living and working at Osho Tapovan in Nepal since the last 16 years. But Nirav was a model and a TV presenter. After becoming an Osho sannyasin at the early age of 16, he has been working and meditating under the guidance of Swami Anand Arun, an early Osho disciple and an international meditation teacher. Today, Nirav travels and facilitates meditation retreats in Nepal and abroad, sharing Osho's vision and meditation. So welcome Nirav in today's episode. Let's start with the favorite topic for most people, which is free love, dancing inside the Osho ashram. And of course, the infamous orgies that we all know about, that people associate actually with the Osho ashram. And of course, you know what? <laughs> so we need to hear from the horse's mouth. Uh, for all our listeners, I'm sure they're all going to be, you know, glued in to listen to this. Because the latest hit documentary series, Wild Wild Country, that was directed by Brother MacLean and Chapman Way, was so popular, you know. Um, and there was so much of, uh, you know, the, this whole cultural conversation has not happened the way the movement had happened. Of course, I mean, times were different. But I'd really like to know from you and share with us your journey, you know, till 16. And now this current avatar, what is it that, of course, you did mention to me that your parents were also Osho followers. But we all, when we grow up in a setup at home, we do choose to become individuals on our own and we don't follow what our parents do uh, most times. What made you follow this? And of course, you cannot get away today without telling me about the orgies also. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mahua. That was a very interesting introduction. <laughs> um, many things uh, that you said uh, in, your, in, in your intro, I would, I would definitely would like to talk about them. But before that, as you said, um, my journey before I was 16 was basically like, it was just like everybody else's journey. Uh, I was in my high school and I had just finished my high school. And then uh, at that time, my parents were very much in, uh, influenced by Osho. Uh, they, used to, they were not followers, they were not disciples, but um, they, were, they used to listen to Osho's discourses and, they, and we used, I still remember having two huge pictures of Osho in our living room. These were two mounted pictures. So my dad and my mom both were very much inspired by his vision, uh, by what he used to say. Uh, I basically thought when I used to look at those pictures and I, you know, when you see your parents following somebody, I, I used to tell them that, you know, this is, I used to look at his pictures and he was very flamboyant and charismatic and with all yes. his, you know, paraphernalia. So, so I said, like, how can this be a spiritual man? How can this be a, like, like we know what spiritual people are supposed to look like or religious figures are supposed to look like. So I, I also had that idea and I said that he looks very uh, egoistic. He looks very proud. And, and I was, I was, I was, I was in that kind of uh, mindset. And then, uh, what happened was when I was in my high school, uh, my parents asked me one day, uh, it, was, it was October, and, and in October we have a very huge uh, festival in Nepal. It's, it's the Dasera. So it's a, it's a big holiday of like 10, 12 days, and we have to visit our relatives. Our rel relatives are coming over to our house. So it's, 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 it's a lot of chaos. So I, I, you know, like being this teenager and wanting to be cool, and everything. So I said, when my parents asked me, there is a meditation retreat happening in a forest. Would you like to go to that? So just to be cool, you know, just to just to avoid the whole festival, I said yes, I, I want to go. And then um, I I came to uh, Tapovan. I came for the retreat, and the very first day I uh, came here. There was lots of dancing happening, as you were saying. Uh, it, it was the evening white robe, and there was a wild music going on, lots of young people, lots of energy, and, and everybody was dancing. And suddenly, I felt at home. You know, it was a click. It was an instant click for me, and I felt like I was at home. And, and I joined in. I didn't, I didn't really uh, think much about it. I didn't give a lot of thought into it, and I just joined in. And... The more I meditated, the more I did different groups, the more I did different sessions, it, 
I went deeper and deeper and deeper into this whole process. And I started feeling very connected with Osho. I used to look at his videos and I used to uh, say to myself, wow, this guy is so intelligent. The things that he says, so progressive and coming out from a uh, spiritual mouth or coming out from a godman as you godman as he was i thought that he was really cool really rebellious he was an icon class and that really hit me and you know and i also liked uh, the way he carried himself you know because most of the times in hindu when you go to hindu gurus and baba ji's they're not very how do you say it uh, not very clean you know they're not very uh, aesthetic to look at but when you looked at when I when you look at Osho, everything was very crisp. The way he moved his hands, the way he was talking, the words that he said. There was not even one word that was uh, like you know he was just blabbering. Everything made sense, and he was so articulate and so intelligent and and so present. And when you looked into his eyes, so these are the physical things, and of course there is the energy that is behind all of these things. Whenever there is an enlightened master. So, so that really uh, hit my uh, youth. Sixteen is very young, Nirav. To yes, uh, that, yes. that that is what amazes me. You know, with sixteen, you're really navigating life through all your emotions. Yeah. You're trying to figure out about yourself. I mean, I don't know. I mean, till twenty five, I probably didn't even know who. You know, <laughs> what is it that I wanted? So, you know, at sixteen, to have that sort of clarity, do do you think that it may have been a little bit of a brainwash also for you? Um, no, not at all. Uh, because I was, I, I still am, and I was uh, very, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't take things at face value, and I wouldn't take things, I'm not superstitious, and I'm not, I, I really uh, like to understand things, and I really uh, uh, look at things very openly. So, no, there was no brainwash. And from my parents' side also, of course, they were inspired by his vision, they listened to his discourses, but they never... Uh, you forced know, you. Uh, forced me or asked me to come and listen to them. And even when I used to say, this guy looks very proud, I don't like him. And and they never like said anything. And I think that also created a space for me to explore on my own. I so mean, I think if, you've if raised something ever, so you know, important, Nirav, that, you know, when parents sometimes try and control yeah. you, you want to go against it. And when they allow you to yes, do exactly. what you want to do, you know, you find uh, that it is so much more easier to embrace. And I, I think you've said something, you've just said words of wisdom for the listeners, because I know I have a whole lot of very young listeners and parents and mothers, because somewhere mothers and fathers. And, uh, you know, we try and force children to follow a certain you know, method that we've tried and tested and we mm. think that should be right for the other individual. Mm. And invariably, that's when the rebellion begins, you know. Anything that's seamlessly, exactly. yeah, exactly. anything that's seamlessly given to us, uh, I think we embrace it really from a very, very deep level. Um, but yeah. Nira, you were a model and, you know, that's a different world altogether. TV presenter, I mean, that's like glamour, glamour. <laughs> And uh, this is amazing because it's like two sides of the personality. So even even this thing, the modeling and 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 the glamour world, that came after I took sannyas. You know, after, after the seven days, I be, I got initiated. I decided to get initiated. I told my I called my parents and I told them I'm going to become a sannyasin. And they were like, "Are you sure about that?" And this, they, and I said, "Yes." And they they were not sannyasins. They were not disciples. So they came. Uh, the, to support me, they just came for the for the event. It's it's and and you know Osho Sanyas is a little different from how Sanyas has been down the ages in in how how uh, Hindu tradition or Buddhist tradition follows Sanyas. Tell us what is it different. Uh, the difference is that uh, we are not required to renounce anything, and there is, and we are only asked to add one thing in our lives, and that is meditation and awareness. And Osho gives us all the freedom to, you know, explore life, to, to, to experience it in all its colors and just try to be aware. Osho says, make mistakes, but don't repeat those mistakes. Make new mistakes. So that is what Osho Sanyas is all about. He, he, termed the, he coined it as Zorba the Buddha, which means, uh, you know, there was a writer, a Greek writer called Nikos Kazantazakis, and he wrote a book called Zorba the Greek. And Osho said that when I read that book, there is a character in the book called Zorba who is so full of life. 
who is who is having lots of fun, who is making lots of love, you know, celebrating, drinking, and everything. Very colorful person. And then he said that just keeping Zorba alone, he is uh, incomplete. There is so much in him, but he's incomplete. And when you look at Gautam the Buddha, the Buddha, Siddhartha Buddha, Siddhartha Gautam, he's so much in silence, so much inside himself, so much in meditation. But at the same time, when you just look at him, he is also incomplete. So I want that my sannyasins should be a combination of Zorba and the Buddha, meditation and celebration, awareness and uh, all the colors of life. So that's how uh, Osho coined his sannyasin. So that's what Osho's sannyas is all about. You don't have to renounce anything. You don't have to leave anything. There is only one thing that you need to add into your life, and that is meditation and awareness. And whatever is non-essential, as you meditate, it will fall, fall down on its own. And whatever is essential will remain with you, and you will grow into that. So that was Osho's, what is Osho's sannyas. You need to but, repeat that for the listeners, Nero. That <laughs> when you meditate, that the things that is not needed in you will fall off. And the yes. things that's needed in you will remain, remain inside you. Remain. And, and, and it will remain in such a way that you will grow. You know, your growth is guaranteed. It's when like that tree, everything. right? The foundation needs to be strong for yes. all the branches yes. to grow in and, you know, for the birds to come in and be there. And for the yes. fruits to flower, you know, and, you know, to f so all of that. Yeah, it's very, very interesting what you said. But there is so much of um, negativity also involved because I think as a society, free love mm -hmm. is not something that um, the culture that you are from. I mean, and I have to tell you, this, this is my first podcast with Nepal. And <laughs> I'm so honored to have you today. I'm equally honored uh, to be the first podcast uh, with you from Nepal. I'm equally honored. I've, I've, I've been through some of your podcasts and they're very interesting, very interesting people that you bring together. So I'm, I'm equally honored, Moa. Thank you so much. Nepal remains one of my favorite places on earth. I love Nepal. You know, I just love, <laughs> yeah, because as an Indian, when you go there, we're so connected culturally. We're yes. we are alike, you know. Yes. And uh, to me, Nepal is the mountains and the people and uh, the mala, the clothing, the art. You know, there's so much there. So, you know, coming back to love and free love, mm -hmm. I'd really like our listeners to understand a little bit more and how much truth is there in the orgies that people know about okay. the Rajneesh okay. I'll, I'll tell you an incident, okay, before I move on to this uh, uh, topic of, of free love. I would, I'd like to tell you an incident. So there was a journalist that came to our ashram and 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 he was he was very you know i was taking him around and he was very curious he was like trying to find something he was constantly trying to look into the windows when you're taking him around he's trying to look under the bridge he's trying to see i i, I didn't understand it at first and then later he opened up himself he opened himself uh, he said so i've heard about this uh, orgies this underground orgies that you guys have where where are those orgies and i just jokingly <laughs> replied i jokingly replied to him i also came in search of that and i'm still searching but i've not found that yet. <laughs> so so i would like to uh, so this whole thing about osho you know as osho, uh, osho was coined osho was famously known infamously famously known as the sex guru so why, why was he called the sex guru? We have to really uh, go into this, to go, really look at it very carefully. Uh, so what happened was in the 1970s, uh, or, you know, imagine that time and imagine India of that time, very uh, Hindu or very religious, very conventional. So at that time, Osho started freely speaking about sex in his lectures. So for, for a godman, you know how godmans are worshipped in India, for how sadhus are worshipped in India, nobody expects a godman to speak about sex. Nobody expects a godman to, you know, now they do because Osho started. So, you know, uh, uh, when, and when Osho was uh, talking about sex, what he was trying to say is that the whole uh, religion, all these religions, the society, our traditions, our norms, has really suppressed sex and has taken it behind the curtain. Everybody's having sex. How are we born? We are bo all born out of sex. But when we talk about sex, when we, you know, like try to openly have a discussion about sex, everybody is hushed. You know, when a child uh, 
talks about sex or when there is something on the television that that relates to sex the channels are changed uh, nobody tells children wh- how people are born nobody really likes to talk about it even adults in a room they nobody really talks about sex and especially in osho's times in in the 1970s it was a very suppressed subject everybody was doing it uh, everybody was born out of it but we were looking at it in a very uh, diseased way I and mean, like it was something very dirty like it was like talking about sex or like accepting it embracing it was was a, was looked upon as very uh, you know it was not looked upon as some someone from a good family would do so this was a great hypocrisy and because of this hypocrisy so much of the uh, bizarre things were born out of it when when something becomes diseased when something starts rotting so many ugly things come out of it that's why look at look at our society today so much of rape is happening so much of pedophilia is happening all of these things all of these sicknesses why they are happening is because we have suppressed sex and we have not accepted it as it is we have not looked upon it you know in in ancient india we had kama sutra in ancient india we had uh, we had something like so, something so uh, beautiful like like science of making love you know our our temples if you go to khajuraho the whole temple is made it glorifies sex in such a beautiful way such a beautiful way of looking at it but down the ages we have uh, made it look very dirty we have made it look very ugly and this has created lots of sickness in the society and it's still there so that's why osho spoke very uh, courageously against it and and he said that all that he was saying is that like when you're hungry you eat food so you don't really think about it all the time just like that it's a very basic need that the body needs sex as well so why do you constantly think about it why do you constantly in our minds we are constantly thinking about sex we are constantly uh you know uh imagining things but uh, outside we try to show that we are so pious we are so holy we, we are we are infallible but that's not the truth so all that osho was trying to do was he exposed this hypocrisy he exposed like you know there are so many celibate uh sadhus and and priests and and pandits who say that they have never had sex but behind the curtains behind the walls they are raping young people young children you know and this has been happening down the ages so much of sexual exploitation especially by religions so this is what osho spoke against and because of that he because of speaking this truth he was uh, first he was given the title the sex guru and a second uh, he also had to pay the price eventually uh, he was he was given poison and he, he he died out of poison you know but he was ready he knew that he would be killed murdered one day but he was ready to pay the price and that's why he was labeled uh, a sex guru uh, because he also wrote a very uh, uh, popular book called from sex to super consciousness but when a book came out you know from written by a uh, spoken by a spiritual leader everybody was shocked everybody was like uh, how can you have sex as a title on a book cover in in the uh, india of 80s so this was a big issue this became a really uh, and that made osho very infamous but at the same time it also made him very famous so he was when he wrote this book sex to super consciousness everybody looked towards sex but nobody the title meant sex to super consciousness he was trying to lead people to super consciousness but nobody looked at super consciousness they looked only at sex so this also shows how sick our minds were and and because we couldn't see the super consciousness we only saw sex so this spoke about the society that we were living in and we are still living in that's I why i so agree with you actually nirav on this because you know i think um, india is so uh, we were so progressive i mean we have uh, the kama sutra we're known as the land of kama sutra there is the khajuraho temples rightly you said i think it's about the invasion that we've had and we've tried to follow you know a very very um, a victorian culture where yes. i think they have made sex to be a really bad thing and yes. uh, you know they tr- like, and i, I think would, i would like to i would like to mention this more why until until just 20 30 years ago women in nepal used to bathe without like you know without being covered uh, uh, their breasts were never covered they we used to have uh, uh, public bathing areas and 
and you know women freely bathed without covering their without wearing a blouse or a bra or covering their breasts and nobody found it uh, vulgar nobody even looked at it you know it was so natural it was so normal you know but what happened is so so whatever happens in india india follows it from the india followed it from the british and yes. what india followed we have followed it because in, in the victorian culture was such that they used to even cover the uh, the legs of the sofas if if you go to a very victorian house even yes. today i have seen the victorian yeah, legs of the to, yeah to, to expose the legs of the sofa yes so in that way uh, you know the same culture came into india when there was a british invasion and that led to india following uh, this culture and then uh, this uh, thing was later followed by nepal so it's very interesting when you talk about nepal and uh, you know people taking uh, women taking their bath without a blouse in uh, in a public space because i had written an article also about this about the blouseless women of bengal you know when you said that in nepal you know women very very uh, you know in public spaces they took their bath you know without their blouses so even that is true it holds true for uh, india and i will talk especially for bengal where i have been you know you know into the um, into places that are not part of kolkata but in the village uh, part of bengal and i have seen women without their blouses but so blouses also was introduced by the british actually you know and the aristocrats of Bengal began making those puffed sleeve blouses and that's when blouses happened and we were made to feel ashamed about our breasts so you're so right when you talk about and i think gender exploitation has happened in a huge way when uh, sex um is uh, discussed and you know when you say about sex and super consciousness i'm a huge believer of that because also the bowel philosophy you know in bengal they do talk about the entire consciousness of a human being is within your body and the body does have the yoni the body does have the you know does have the vagina and the penis and human procreation happens from there you know so i i so agree with you on that the, the only the sad thing what happened was uh you know as time passed by when we were the, the eastern side of civilization there were time there was there was a time when it was very rich when it was very affluent so so you know the history is written or the rules are made by those who have the money who have the power absolutely so when we were affluent when we were uh, thriving uh, you know our our we, we had our own culture we had our own uh, way of things we had our own and a very healthy and holistic lifestyle but as there was this invasion uh, this this start specially started after the british invasion um, I I don't know how true this uh, uh, letter is, but I have written. I have I have read a letter. I think it was written by Ma- Macaulay. I'm not sure. Uh, he has said that to make India poor, we have to destroy their. Uh, he has he has he has addressed the uh, uh, he has addressed the British Parliament, and he has said that to enslave India, we have to destroy their education system first. because uh, there are so many rich people here the, the the culture is so rich the civilization is so rich and and i have seen that uh, the main crux of it is in their education system so we have to first destroy their education system this is a letter that was that he wrote to the british parliament and and i he was a parliamentarian and he has he came to india and he saw the glory of india you know he saw this rich india he saw this thriving india and he and then he said that to enslave it we have to first destroy the education system so that's how it started you know when when the british education came here how, what was the how was the british education designed the british education was designed in such a way it was designed to make clerks for her majesty the government Absolutely. and that's what otherwise we had a very uh, you know organic very holistic education system that that taught us the glory of our culture you know the glory of our civilization the eastern civilization the gurukul system you know it, it there was spirituality in it there was meditation there was yoga there was astronomy there was science there were all kinds of things but all of it is it was destroyed and 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 we were so much closer to nature all the gurukuls used to be in the forest they used to be and 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 all the gurus they used to be and they used to be evolved souls somebody who has gone into themselves and have 
and have a great level of intelligence, not only intelligence that has come through books and scriptures, but something through their own experience, through meditation, through yoga. So slowly that was destroyed. And then this education system was imposed upon us, which was making clerks, which was only designed to make obedient clerks for Her Majesty the government. And then the same education system came to Nepal also because we always follow India. And that's how things were destroyed. And we were made to believe that we are inferior, that our culture is inferior, and we have, we have to cover the legs of our sofas. <laughs> you know, I'm almost visualizing and seeing those sofas that I've seen in so many homes of my aunties where they've had tie-ups, so white color, you know, around them. <laughs> You're so right, my goodness. Yes, you are. So, Nirav, I'd really also like to know about free love. What does that mean to you? So, what is free love? Free love, if I, if I really ask myself, you know, the freedom to express your heart, the freedom to express the warmth in your heart, the freedom to relate with the other without, uh, you know, any boundaries, without any uh, precon preconceived notions and the freedom to receive, to, be, to, be, to, to, to have a welcoming heart to receive love. That is free love. You know, I know you wanna, want to talk about sex, but even higher than that is, is this, because most of the times, you know, when we are children, nobody teaches us how to love. Nobody teaches us how to share. Nobody teaches us how to nourish the heart. Everybody teaches us how to, uh, you know, earn more money, how to excel in class, how to leave the other behind, how to, uh, how to collect more. Nobody teaches us how to. And when, when is the heart happy? The heart is happy when it is allowed to receive love. The heart is happy. It celebrates when it is allowed to express love. The heart is nourished. When it, is, when it is allowed to share. But when we try to share our toys, we are, we, are, we are told not to share it. We are told, like, no, you have to keep it for yourself. So in this way, the heart has constantly been, uh, you know, it, 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 it is dying every day. I agree with you, Nira, fully on this. Completely agree with you. So when I talk about free love that Osho was talking about, he was giving this freedom to the heart. He was giving this freedom to human beings and telling them that your basic nature is to love and you will be happiest when you're allowed to love, when you receive love. So that is what Osho was talking about when he was talking about free love. Yeah, and I also think that, you know what, we're all little children, you know, and we're all little babies, actually. And I was listening to one of his speeches where he did talk about, you know, why a child when uh, is in the mother's womb, you know, is in that amniotic fluid all around it. There's a fluid around it and they feel secure mm -hmm. and they are loved. They know the, the child is not eating on its own. The child is doing nothing on its own. And it's just the mother's energy that is keeping that child alive. And I think, you know, and it, it so resonates with me that when you come out, you're constantly looking for that security. And, you know, the system around us breaks you in every possible way because of conditionings that we've had over millions and millions of invaders and, you know, millions of, you know, years and years actually of uh, people teaching you everything uh, to do with the brain and not with the heart. And I think what is so amazing today is this, that, Nirav, that, you and me are having this conversation and people are talking about EQ, you know, emotional quotient. People are talking about how it's so important to have your emotional intelligence at par with your intellectual, uh, you know, uh, with your intelligence uh, quotient in you to be a successful leader, business person, a family man, a human being, you know, in its totality. So this resonates so much with me, Nirav. And, uh, you know, also when I talk about sexual freedom, to me, I think it, it lies at the heart of human dignity, equality and civil liberties, you know, which, you know, which should be there. I mean, sexual freedom has to be there. You should be uh, allowed to uh, choose who uh, would be in your body. The first thing I would like to talk about this, uh, this 
this great disparity that is there between EQ and IQ. So, you know, in the West, what has happened today? And, and I'll also come back to your uh, uh, question about sexual freedom. Uh, see, today the West has become so developed, you know, materially it has grown so much. The science there has grown so much. Life has become so comfortable. But look at uh, the lives, the individual lives of people. You know, there is so much of insomnia, there is so much of depression, there is so much of anxiety, so much of suicide happening. So, so you know, in the beginning, in the beginning of the 20th century, it was said that if education is, if there is free education, if there is free health, if there is uh, equal opportunities for occupy, for for employment, then everybody is going to be happy. There is not going to be any misery. But look at where we stand today. You know, the world is taking a news dive. You know, we are on the brink of a global suicide. So why is because there was only growth of the, the, the intel, intelligence quotient. The, there was only growth of the outer. There was only growth. People only focused on growing on the outside. Say that on the, again. The and again, and, and, Nirav, you're so right. Yeah. So if, if there was a balance between both the growth, like, you know, if you look at a human body, if my guru keeps on saying, uh, Swami Anand Arun, who I live with and who I work with, he's, he's an he's a international meditation teacher and a great author, great speaker. So I've been living with him and I live under his mentorship. He constantly says, you know, when, when you look at the human body, if, just, if, your, if only your hand grows and your legs doesn't grow, your neck doesn't grow, then it will look very ugly, you know? So that's the same thing that has happened with the West. They've only grown on the outside, but they have given no importance to the inside. Similarly, to the, to the East, what has happened is we have only focused on the inside for, for thousands of years. That's why we are so poor today. That's why there is so much of, we are lagging behind in so many things. So there needs to be a, a merger of these two, you know, that there needs to be. And that is where Osho comes. That is where Osho's vision comes. That is where Osho's philosophy comes. The, an equal and balanced growth of the outer and the inner. Zorba, the Buddha. So this is uh, what I wanted to talk about. It was fantastic, Nirav. I can go on and on talking to you, you know, because to me, my podcast also will have a whole lot of other guests when I want to talk about sexual revolution that's really being witnessed, not just the ability for a woman to go ahead and buy the contraceptive pill like an OTC drug because again there is a huge marketing ploy of pharmaceutical companies who would want to sell more and more without telling uh, the woman what are the consequences of that. That is one uh, you know one part where sexual liberation can be seen that a woman can go ahead and buy her pill and condoms are now available but we are talking about sexual liberation at a very very deep level and you know at a level where you can choose um you know, who is with you. And of course, like you said, sex and consciousness, they are completely intertwined. I mean, that's my philosophy too. And um, it was wonderful talking to you. And I hope that we meet soon. And it's my first podcast for all the listeners for Nepal. I definitely would hope to bring in more people from Nepal. And I will ask you, Nira, for anybody you know who's doing something different, the art of Nepal, you know, is something, the watercolors that I've seen, the musicians from <laughs> Nepal, they're so close to my heart. Uh, right now, when I'm talking to you, I'm transported into those little, uh, you know, quaint cafes that I've gone into. And people are naturally talented there. And so if you know anyone, please uh, ask them to get in touch with me. I would love to host them on my podcast because in my Thank heart... You. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yes, in my heart, I'm, I'm also a little bit of Nepali. I grew up, <laughs> yes, because I understand the language, you know, every word of it. I don't speak it with the fluency that I did earlier. But I understand every word of Nepali. And uh, thank you, Nirav. This was amazing. And I wish you a lot of success. And, and also for the listeners, Nirav is extremely handsome with an amazing smile. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. so thank you, I have well. to stop myself from not crushing badly on him. You know? But you're allowed to do that. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> All right. We were talking about sexual freedom. We were talking about free love, you know, so you're allowed to crush on me. I, I, I needed to get the permission. So yes, uh, <laughs> thank you. Just before we go, Mohua, there's one thing that I would like to say, uh, because you were talking so much about uh, sexual freedom, if you allow me. Uh, yes, please. 
so I just I just want to say that you know living with Osho for so many years, living in a commune uh, for so many years, I have come to a place you know where where uh, so people keep asking me. Uh, so what have you learned by staying at an Osho commune? What is it that, you know, what did you get from it? There are so many things. But but one thing that is also very important is that we stopped judging people through the glasses of sexuality, you know. And I feel myself, you know, I think that Liberated. it's such a healthy place to be in. Mm. Because I still remember, you know, when when I myself, when we, when we were talking, when I was talking with my friends and we would like, you know, definitely sometimes we would slut shame somebody or we would you know say that oh this guy has a lot of sex or this girl is so uh, you know all those things now I don't I no more have those eyes I, I, I try to find them but I saw that in by living here for 16 years those those glasses have disappeared so I just want to say that none of us are entitled to judge anybody uh, for their sexual choice and and that you know this this particular subject, this particular aspect. If we accept it, if we embrace it, and if we worship it, actually, because it gives life, it is very divine. If we worship it, and if it be, if we look at it from a very healthy point of view, it can it can bear beautiful flowers. It can bear beautiful creations. It can. That's why Osho was saying sex to superconsciousness. Great intelligence can come from sexual liberty. Great intelligence can come if you accept your sexual energy and if you embrace it. Uh, there is so much that we can talk about this. I, I just wanted to I say can go on and on, Nirav. And what you said <laughs> is going to stay back with me is the eyes. That, you know, your eyes changed and you started viewing the world differently. And uh, this will stay back with me because, you know, when you're talking to me, I'm almost choking up because to me, I also believe that the divinity in a sexual energy exchange. Of course, there are a lot of people who would say that it is just like any other uh, energy. And I think divinity also comes with its own chains where you say that, no, you know, it has to be one person and not multiple people. And there is a whole lot of people who also talk about polyamory. They talk about, you know, not being in a monogamous relationship. And so there are different views and different thoughts. And I'm not an expert to talk on all of that. But with my podcast, I definitely get to delve um, you know, into the minds of uh, people who've been following and walking their talk. So you leave me with a very heart filled with little, little flowers that's growing by the lake. And I am walking right now in Kathmandu, in those streets. <laughs> and I am, you know, transported to Nepal. And uh, thank you so much, Nirav. You're, You're a great welcome speaker. You're to come here any day. I am Guruka. I know that your heart is in Nepal. You feel the Nepali spirit. You feel I do. the Nepali heart. You're always welcome to come to our commune. It's called Osho Tapovan International. It's a beautiful place in the hills with lots of forests. Even now we are inside a fog as I talk to you. And 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 very beautiful people that live here. You know, you will you will if you really want to taste the uh, fragrance of Osho, if you really want to taste the salt of Osho's ocean, then this is definitely the place that you can come here and see happy people, you know, with very, very less, uh, like, you know, we don't have bank balances, we don't have big houses, but really good hearts and celebrating people. If you really want to see that issue, and you're always welcome to come to Osho Tapu. Absolutely. I am going to take you up on this. I'm just waiting for things to settle a bit. And I think from September, everything will open up and I will fix up to be there. I, You know, I think my New Year's is going to be dedicated uh, to doing something very, very different this year. And I will take you up on that. Thank you so much for being on today's uh, episode. And you are Thank a wonderful you. speaker. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mahua. Thank you so much. To you, our dearest listeners, you can find us on your favorite streaming services. Find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcast, and of course, all other major streaming services. With loads of love, we are Moody Mahua's podcast, where Hatke is hot. <laughs> <laughs>